Psalm chapter number 55. I got a great passage of scripture here. It's a Psalm of David, as you can tell by looking at the title. And I just, I just, I love the Lord and the way he lays things out for us. It's pretty great. Um, he, he has this passage here right after we talked about charity on Sunday afternoon or Sunday evening last week. And you're going to see here this passage is, is really, a, it's kind of a good counterbalance to that whole charity topic. Because he's going to talk about some enemies of God and enemies of himself that have no desire to get right. And uh, that's, a, that's a tough one because when you're trying to serve God and you've got people around you that aren't, uh, you can do all you, you know, all you can to be loving and charitable and forgiving. But when evil men are going to stay evil, they're coming after you. And when you're in that situation, if you're in that situation, and if you stick around, and if God tarries, and the Lord tarries and doesn't come back soon, we're all going to be in that situation. And uh, what, what I want to talk to you about is being sustained by God. And that's what David writes this thing, and uh, we'll show you where I'm getting that thought from when we read it. Start in verse number 1, if you would, please. The Bible says, Give ear to my prayer, O God, and hide not thyself from my supplication. Attend unto me and hear me. I mourn in my complaint and make a noise. Because of the voice of the enemy, because of the oppression of the wicked, for they cast iniquity upon me, and in wrath they hate me. My heart is sore pain within me, and the terrors of death are fallen upon me. Fearfulness and trembling are come upon me, and horror hath overwhelmed me. And I said, Oh, that I had wings like a dove, for then would I fly away and be at rest. Lo, then would I wander far off and remain in the wilderness, Selah. So you see that Selah, and you also notice talking about wandering off and, re, uh, and, and remaining in the wilderness, and wings like a dove to fly away. If you know the other passages of Scripture, you realize doctrinally we're talking about the tribulation period here, where the Lord's going to tell Israel to, to get on the wings of a great bird and get out into the wilderness and hide. Now look at verse number 8. I would escape, I would hasten my escape from the windy storm and tempest. So obviously there's some crazy things going on in the weather patterns. And, and uh, that windy storm and tempest, that could have also to do with wars and things like that. In verse number 9 it says, Destroy, O Lord, and divide their tongues. For I have seen violence and strife in the city. Day and night they go about upon the walls thereof. Mischief also and sorrow in the midst of it. Wickedness is in the midst thereof, deceit and guile depart not from her streets. Now watch this in verse number 12. For it was not an enemy that reproached me, then could I have borne it. Neither was it he that hated me that did magnify himself against me, then I would have hid myself from him. But it was thou, a man mine equal, my guide and mine acquaintance. We took sweet counsel together and walked into the house of God in company. Let death seize upon them, and let them go down quick into hell. For wickedness is in their dwellings and among them. As for me, I will call upon God, and the Lord shall save me. Evening and morning and at noon will I pray and cry aloud, and he shall hear my voice. He hath delivered my soul in peace from the battle that was against me, for there were many with me. God shall hear and afflict them, even he that abideth of old Selah. Because they have no changes, therefore they fear not God. He hath put forth his hands against such as be at peace with him. He hath broken his covenant. The words of his mouth were smoother than butter, but war was in his heart. His words were softer than oil, yet they were drawn swords. Cast thy burden upon the Lord, and he shall sustain thee. You see that? That's what we're going to talk about tonight. He shall never suffer the righteous to be moved. But thou, O God, shalt bring them down into the pit of destruction. Bloody and deceitful men shall not live out half their days, but I will trust in thee. Notice that bloody and deceitful men shall not live out half their days, but in the day and age that you live in, bloody and deceitful men live, of to, live to old age and good men die young. But it says bloody and deceitful men will not live out half their days. You know why? It's a tribulation passage. All right, let's go to the Lord in prayer and then we'll ask him to... Bless the preaching, and we'll get into it here tonight. I'm going to pick on uh, Brother Berlucci. Would you mind praying, please? Thank you. 
gospel, Lord, pray to give our preacher the strength to get through this message, Lord, and, and the rest to be able to recuperate tonight and to be with this family, Father. Lord, uh, we come to you now in a serious time and just ask that you uh, use the words of God to speak to us now, Father, as you do best, Lord. Let your Holy Spirit come in here and clear our minds, and clear our thoughts, and, and uh, give us the attention we need to, to make this time profitable. Uh, we take some time out of our week. Does everybody hear exactly what they need? There's someone here that might not be saved here this evening. I pray that you show them the desperate need of salvation here tonight, Lord. You're the only, you're the only one that can do it for them. That, that salvation is in the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. Make that clear to them, Father. Again, Lord, we thank you for everything you've done. Keep us safe here tonight. Be with the preacher now. We pray in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. Amen. All right, I want to take that thought. If you would look back at verse number 22, taking the thought from there again. I want you to notice something about this. He says, cast thy burden upon the Lord, and he shall sustain thee. He shall never suffer the righteous to be moved. Here you've got the sweet psalmist of Israel, David, a man after God's own heart, a real warrior. I mean, David, as I've told you before, and I'm sorry to repeat myself, but he is my favorite Bible character outside of Jesus Christ or maybe the Apostle Paul. David is my favorite Bible character. This guy has been through the absolute ringer, and it is like no matter how bad things keep getting in David's life, no matter how many betrayals he suffers, no matter how many times his kids make an absolute mess of his life, and he makes messes himself, and his enemies turn against him, and his father-in-law wants to kill him, and all the, everything seems to go wrong for David. And it's like the guy is so stinking tough, he keeps bouncing back. I, I appreciate a tough guy, don't you? I'm sorry, but I appreciate a tough guy on a day of pansies. David ain't a pansy. But the thing about David that I love is that in spite of all the problems, he doesn't seem to get a hard heart. It seems like all the problems David goes through, he actually seems to get softer. He seems to get better with time, yet he never lost his edge. David was still always ready, willing, and able to go out to battle. Even to the point where as an old man, he's going out to fight anyways, and his guys are like, you don't got it anymore, man. You're going to die. Stay back. We got this taken care of. Don't quench the light of Israel. I absolutely love King David. If I can take some of his writings and soak in them a little bit, just let them become part of who I am, that's what I want. And God's given us this tonight so you and I can get some help from what to do and how to find the sustaining power of God. David says, cast thy burden upon the Lord. There's your prerequisite. And he shall sustain thee. Notice where the sustenance comes from. You think about that, if you would, that God in the Old Testament, as Israel's wandering around in the wilderness, God sustained them in the wilderness. Think about that for a minute. That's a pretty powerful statement because they're, they're living in a wilderness. I mean, you couldn't just run down to the store and buy new shoes. Because every so often that pillar's moving, that pillar cloud, that pillar of fire, it's time to pack up, it's time to go. And now it's like, wait a second, I gotta, I'm in the middle of trying to make the kid a new shirt. You understand that they couldn't do that logistically in that wilderness, but God Almighty sustained them anyhow because their shoes didn't get old. I mean, you're walking around all this time and their shoes just aren't wearing out. Their clothes just aren't wearing out. Do you know God has more than one way to sustain you? We sit back and say, where's the raise? I need more money. I don't understand why. But, but it's, it's amazing to me how God has other ways of sustaining you. I think back in my life to God sustaining me. I, I think you've heard me talk about it before, but my red Dodge Dynasty. You remember me talking about that, most of you? When we first got married, that was the car that I had. It was the ugliest thing you ever seen in your life. I always tease Grace that she fell in love with me for the car, you know. But, I mean, that thing was pretty sweet. It was equipped with the white smoke when you push the gas that engulfed everybody behind you at the light. And I was horrible about maintenance. I was the worst person you ever met in the world about taking care of anything God gave me. I was terrible about taking care of it. I don't know why, but it's just a weakness in my character. It was a fault that I had. I didn't check the oil. I didn't worry about the I didn't change the oil because it cost money. I just kept running it. As long as it fired up and got down the road, it didn't matter if it was as long as you made it home, good. Let it take a break. It'll be fine tomorrow. That was just the way I handled it. Listen, I took the thing to the mechanic. It was out of oil. They said, man, this thing is out of oil. There's like very little oil left in this. What's there is dirty and there's a cracked engine block. I said, all right, it'll be fine. You know, I mean, God kept that thing running. For, I'm telling you, I was in Bible college. I was broke as I could possibly be. I was trying to serve Jesus Christ and I was an idiot who asked for my own problems because I didn't want to come off the couple bucks it'd take to dump oil in the vehicle. I was an idiot and yet I still have seen God sustain me in marvelous ways. There's more ways that God takes care of you than what you even realize or I even realize sometimes. 
I'm grateful to a God that can sustain me. I remember the, the red, uh, the red uh, minivan that my wife and I had, man. That thing had a slipping transmission forever. I mean, the transmission on that thing, you'd push the gas and it'd be like, boom, and then we'd be, be good, you know what I mean? <laughs> so we, got, we had two cars and there was somebody in the church that, was, that had, had one and they were poorer than us and they needed it. And so we were like, I know what to do. We're going to be generous. We're going to sacrifice. We'll just go down to one vehicle. We're going to give them the minivan. That thing had been running for me with a slipping, slipping transmission for years. As soon as I gave it to a brother in Christ, guess what? Transmission went out. <laughs> he must not be as spiritual as me. I don't know. <laughs> I'm just talking about God has ways of sustaining you. And a lot of times we don't even notice it. God took care of Elijah, didn't he? He goes to Ahab. He says, it's not going to rain for three and a half years. God, the judgment of God has come. God says, once you tell him, go hide by the brook Cherith. He goes down there. He hides by the brook. God sends those ravens dropping off food to Elijah. He's eating good. He's drinking good. Everything's fine. And then the brook dries up. I wonder what Elijah was thinking. I think about this. I wonder what Elijah sat there thinking, like, God, what are you doing to me? Like, are you kidding me right now? You sent me here. I gave the message I was supposed to send. I told them the drought was coming. Now I'm sitting here, and, and I'm sure he's like you and me. He's thinking, well, it's because of the world, the crazy world, and all the crazy things they're doing that all the judgment of God is coming, but I didn't do anything. I'm serving God. So I was expecting them all to have inflation. I was expecting all them to get, lose their jobs. I was expecting everybody else to have the problems, but I wasn't really thinking the problems were going to actually come home to me. But no, the drought that God had sent on the nation of Israel also affected the man that God sent to preach the message saying a drought is coming. You follow that? He had to be sitting there beside that brook thinking, God, what are you, gonna do? what are you doing? I imagine that same morning when the, he's looking for the ravens and there's no ravens. And God says to Elijah, he says, listen, I want you to go down to a widow woman because there I've commanded her to sustain me. Once one thing dried up and he's sitting there wondering what God's doing, he has another way of taking care of not just his man, but also taking care of that widow woman. And God sustains him throughout that drought and sustains her through him. God is a God that can sustain and will sustain his people. And I'm grateful for a God like that. Do you know the word sustain means support? It means bear and uphold. It means to keep from falling, to keep alive. You know what we need? We need sustaining. I'm telling you this morning, I don't care how much evening, whatever it is to you, it might be something different to me. I'm not sure what day it is, so it's all good, right? I'm like Sophia yesterday, like, what day is it and where am I? You know? But listen, in spite of the fact that, you know, whatever I was trying to say, I just lost my train of thought. So look at my next point. Here we go. Look at verses 12, and four, 12 through 14. You're going to need sustaining. In spite of the fact that you're serving the Lord trying to do what's right. In spite of the fact that you're, you're dedicated to Jesus Christ. You're here on a Wednesday night. You're not backing off. I'm telling you, you're going to have times in your life when you're going to need God to uphold you. Because there's no way you can do it yourself. Look at him in verse number 12. He said, for it was not an enemy that reproached me. Then could I have borne it. Neither was it he that hated me that did magnify himself against me. Then I would have hid myself from him. But it was thou, a man mine equal, my guide and my acquaintance. We took sweet counsel together and walked into the house of God in company. Notice he needed sustaining because it was one thing when all of them turn on you, right? We kind of expect that from the world nowadays, don't we? We expect them to be against what we believe. We expect them to be against what we stand for. We expect them to give us resistance. But here's how the devil works. You come into church and you're thinking, well, I'm in church. And all those problems, all that wickedness and all the betrayal and all the backstabbers and all the enemies of God are out there. But now I'm here in my safe place. And what we don't realize is that even though you're in the will of God, doing what God wants you to do, the effects of the world around you has ways of coming home and affecting you even somewhere like this. I'll take it a step farther. Those things can even happen in your personal home because of sin. I'm telling you, if the world keeps going the way it's going, you and I are going to need to find the sustaining power of God to be able to finish this race. And he's got plenty of it, so you'll be all right. 
He said, it, it was one thing when the enemies were against me, but, but man, when it was a man my equal, it was a man that I remember walking to the house of God in company with him. I remember fellowshipping with him. I remember he was a true brother, and all of a sudden, this true brother, the devil got a hold of him, and the devil turned him around from the way he was going to being against God, and a friend of mine, a close acquaintance of mine, somebody that I truly love, turns around and puts a knife in my back. And it's really just more than I can handle. I can't take this. I'm done. This was the one, this was the line, Lord. I told you that there was a line, and I knew that if certain things happened to me, I couldn't handle those things. And now that thing that I knew I couldn't handle, you let happen. And how in the world can I even do this? And what he found is that when he cast his burden on God, God got him through what he thought was going to be the end of him. And that's the kind of God we got. I've seen the Lord do it in the church here. I've just seen things where I thought, man, this is it. It's over. Remember COVID? I thought, oh my goodness. We've seen God sustain us. Notice some things in the passage. I want you to see these things about wicked people because it's going to be important for you to understand what you're getting into when you deal with the wicked. First of all, one of the ways they're going to hurt you and try to undermine you and try to cut your feet out from under you is with their words. Look at verse 3. Because of the voice of the enemy, because of the oppression of the wicked, for they cast iniquity upon me and in wrath, they hate me. Notice the oppressive words because of the voice of the enemy, because of the oppression of the wicked. Look down with me, please, at verse number 21. The words of his mouth were smoother than butter, but war was in his heart. His words were softer than oil, yet they were drawn swords. That's a scary verse. Because here he's got, he's got a friend. He's got an acquaintance. He's got somebody who he thinks even believes just like he believes and he trusts this guy and, and this guy's talking all smooth and all sweet and buttering him up. But the reality is he's looking back on the situation. He's thinking, man, I'm remembering those conversations and I thought we were having a great conversation, but I see now he was setting me up the whole time. I see now he was talking nice to me, but he didn't mean anything of the kind. You ever deal with people like that? Boy, I have. Let me tell you something. That is a mark of a wicked person. You better watch out when you get around somebody like that. There's, there's war in their heart. They'll say all the right things. Actually, when you talk to them, you walk away going, man, that's the nicest guy I ever met. Man, he's a sweetheart. He is so complimentary and he's so encouraging and he's so spiritual. He'll make sure he says all the things that make you think he's truly spiritual. He'll talk all about Jesus and love and God and even oftentimes the King James Bible, but there's actually war in his heart. I mean, you got to figure out where that thing's coming from. And it's a scary thing. There's oppression in his words. Look at that in verse number three. That's, that's like he's putting some kind of a burden on you. He's actually, he's actually, you walk away feeling troubled, feeling oppressed, feeling pushed down. Look at verse number three as well. He says, they cast iniquity upon me. It's insulting words. I, I see that two different ways. When somebody's casting iniquity upon me, I'm thinking that more than likely what happened is he actually starts making accusations. You know why a lot of people don't want to talk to you? Have you, have you not noticed it's really hard nowadays to get young people to open up? People get like, you know why? They're used to people trying to trap them in their words. They're used to people being critical. They're used to everybody all the time having a correction, right? It's like, I don't want to tell you what I'm actually thinking because I know I'm going to get criticized. Because you live in a very critical time period. You live in a very critical nation. You live in a time where people, everybody's in each other's business and gossiping about each other and knows everything about everybody else. It's critical. That critical spirit causes people to close off. It casts iniquity upon me. You know what I don't want to be? I don't want to be the kind of person that... I'm just always finding fault with people like we talked about in 2 Corinthians. Thinketh no evil. I mean, I told somebody recently, I said, listen, just stop trying to say what's right and just tell me what you're thinking. I promise you I'm not picking you apart. I'm trying to understand what you mean by what you're saying. Have you ever had somebody cast iniquity on you? 
Oh, I know the naughtiness of thine heart, David, like his brothers did when he went down to view the battle. He was just doing what God had done, his father had told him to do. He was down there. He saw what was going on. He was doing the right thing at the right time, the right way. And his brothers said, I know the naughtiness of thine heart. Cast an iniquity on him. You remember Saul? Saul's making accusations against David, and David goes out of his way to prove to Saul, listen, I, I, I had you tonight. See the skirt in my hand? I cut your skirt off. I promise you, you're chasing me like somebody would chase a partridge or like somebody would chase a flea. Saul, I didn't do it. I'm not going to do it. I could have done it, but I didn't. My guys wanted me to. They think I lost my cotton picking mine because I had a chance to kill you dead, and I wouldn't do it. Saul makes a confession. Well, you know what? You're right, and I'm wrong, and all this stuff, and then turns around and starts haunting them again. Wicked person. That kind of interaction with people will wear you down. The people at work will wait to find an opportunity to cast iniquity on you because they want to taint your testimony. I see it that way. But I also see that cast, he casteth iniquity on me because you can't get away from their filthiness. I don't want to hear Jesus Christ's name taken in vain. You understand that? I don't want to see a couple of queers kissing. You understand that? I don't want to see them walking around holding hands all the time. It's like they're casting it on me all the time. I, I don't want to see the way some people dress. I'm not interested. I, I don't want to see all that. I don't need to know all that. And yet it's always being cast on you all the time. They're casting iniquity on me. Listen to me. With time, if you're trying to serve Jesus Christ, with time, it begins to wear on you and wear on you and wear on you and wear on you. And before you know it, you need God to help you stand up because you get desensitized, you get tired of fighting, you get tired of resisting, you just say, listen, I've had it, that's enough, I quit. You need God to sustain you. There's words, there's so many words nowadays running around our heads. It's words. Instagram and all the rest, of it. I know those are pictures, but everybody's got their words going out, you know, everybody's got to be saying stuff all the time, and I am telling you, that stuff wears you down, it's the words of the wicked. Notice their angry words in verse number three. In the wrath, they hate me. You better watch out for people that are too angry. When you get mad, watch out for yourself. God will, the devil will use your mouth to break down your brethren, to break down your family. The devil will use your mouth to break down your friends. I'm all for joking around, okay? I'm, I'm not, so don't get hypersensitive on this. Let's not take this too far. But be careful if your jokes are always putting other people down all the time. There's a line, man. And it kind of comes to a point sometimes where you're like, I don't think you're really joking anymore. Be careful about that. Angry people, they cast wrath, and in wrath they hate me. You realize if you stand for Jesus Christ in this day and age, you're going to have people hate you. Period. And can I be honest with you? For me personally, it wears on me. I know you think I don't care and I don't let it touch me, but it, it touches me more than you think. It's hard sometimes to be just standing up for Jesus Christ. It gets hard sometimes to be that guy when you walk in the room, everybody quiets down. It's hard sometimes for the kids, you know, oh, sh st stop the abort conversation. She's here. Oh, you know, get, can't say that around holy roller. It wears you out after a while. You know what their problem is? Their problem is not you. Their problem is God. And they're angry because you keep bringing to the forefront of their conscience the fact that they ain't doing right and they're wicked and it angers them and it makes them mad. And so then they start using their words to try to break you down. You need God to sustain you because of the words of the wicked. Number two, hope I'm not boring you to death tonight. The ways of the wicked. Look at this in verse number nine. It says, destroy, O Lord, and divide their tongues, for I've seen violence and strife in the city. I find it interesting that he says, divide their tongues. You see that? How that plays into their words? Obviously, they're using words to break you down. They're using words to try to undermine you, and that's why you need the sustaining power of God, because they're trying to undermine you all the time. But you'll notice their ways. He says, divide their tongues. You know what they have? They have unity. You know, this world is always preaching unity. 
Get together, get together, get together. Unity. You know the only unity they have is in selfishness. The only reason they're able to get together is because I live for me and you live for you. And so now we understand each other and birds of a feather flock together. I will 100% tell you what you are once you introduce me to your friends. I'm dead serious. I don't care how you act on Sunday. Let me meet your friends that you hang out with. I know who you are. I know what you are. I know what's going on in your head. I know exactly what your appetites are. I got you pegged by who you hang out with. Right. You know what he's praying? He's saying, God, you got to bust them up because they're all uniting against me. You ever have that happen to you, trying to serve God? And you feel like you're absolutely the only one? You need the sustaining power of God because as in your human nature, you desire for people to like you. That's the honest truth. Now I get adapted to, I, I know we can adapt, and I get adapted to being alone. I get adapted to people not liking me, but nothing about me is like, yeah, that's my preference. My preference is for people to like me. You need God to sustain you because they'll get together, and it's interesting, he says, to divide their tongues. See that? Well, that takes you back to the Tower of Babel where God divided their tongues. And it coincidentally, the Tower of Babel, there's your root for Babylon. You see Mystery Babylon the Great in the book of Revelation. This is a tribulation passage. Doctrinally, he's talking about the tribulation period. But historically, David's saying, God, I'm trying to serve you. I'm trying to do right by you. And they're grouping together and they're all talking. And God, it got so bad that they influenced people in my church family. They influenced my inner circle. They influenced people I thought loved you. They influenced guys that I fellowshiped with. And there was unity in the spirit between me and them. I encouraged them and they encouraged me. And then God, somehow or another, the devil got in there and turned those people that I love against me. And God, that's more than I can stink and take. If you don't hold me up, I'm going to quit. What will happen to you? And sooner or later this will happen. Somebody you're fellowshipping with, the devil gets a hold of them. Just stay at it long enough. Somebody that was a part of the church gets sideways and leaves over something ridiculous. Usually, it's, I'm sorry, I'm not trying to be a jerk, but the devil finds a breach in the wall and then he wiggles his way in there and he gets that down in your mind and your heart and then he works that angle. And then everything you see and everything you do in the church, every time you come, everything that happens, everything everybody says is interpreted in light of the root of the problem, which was something dumb. And you'll see it happen as the church grows. It's wonderful, but as we get more people, you just got more human nature, more opportunities for the devil to work on people. And ain't it, ain't it something how since we don't have a whole lot of support out there, we come in here and then we find a family? Hey, man, if you don't think you have a family, wait till something happens. Wait till something happens. And you send out prayer requests. You find out who loves you and who doesn't. We got a family here. And it's a blessing. And it sustains you for a while. And then the devil gets in there. And he gets somebody. And he gets them all twisted and jacked up. He gets them, gets, he'll get you to where all you see is the faults. When you first came, it was the best place in the world. Right. And now all of a sudden, all you can see is Pastor Reagan doesn't do this right. Or, you know, Miss Grace, that's the problem. It's Miss Grace. If she was a different preacher's wife, it would be different. Or it's Brother so-and-so. Or it's that deacon at the door. He's too rough and he needs to, you know, he stop, you know, it, it's always something. The devil get there and he'll start stirring it up. And then it's like, man, Lord, why do we even do this? You know how many people are out of church because of church? Do you hear what I said? How many people are out of church because of church? Well, I got hurt in church and you should never get hurt in church. Well, you've heard my argument already. I'll just bounce it off you so I won't make the point a you know, million times over. But you go back to work anyways because it's necessary. You think you come to church that the devil's not going to try to get in here, not going to use somebody in the church to hurt you, to try to get you out? It's the ways of the wicked. And sometimes people that are right at one point wind up getting backslid because things happen to them, and the devil gets in there and gets them all backslid on God, and they were right, and now they're not right anymore. But that boiling frog thing, they don't usually just say, I'm out of here, see ya. Not usually. Usually it's a process of cancer in the soul. And they try, to, they try to 
pervert as many people around them as they can before they go. They try to take as many of them with them as they can. They try to find unity in their selfishness. You've got to watch out for that. David's saying, Lord, please divide their tongues. Their mischievous ways. Look at that in verse number 10. Day and night they go about upon the walls thereof. We're talking about the way of the wicked. Mischief also and sorrow are in the midst of it. They're going where? Anybody remember Sunday morning? What were they doing in Nehemiah once they built the walls? They were going around the walls, right? They were marching around the walls different directions as a, as a testimony to Jesus Christ, as a testimony to what God had done, as a rub it in their face. You said if a fox came up here, he'd break it down. We're all up here marching around because look what God did. We're dedicating this to the Lord. We're walking circumspectly and marching right behind him. Is what the devil's really going to use to get them. Because they're on the walls in verse 10. Day and night they go about upon the walls thereof. Well, this is supposed to be a, a special city. This is supposed to be a sacred place. How do they get in here? What are they doing here? You can see that it was happening back here. It happened to King David. You can see it happened to the Apostle Paul. Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. Diotrephes won't have me in because he wants the preeminence. Look at all the Alexander the coppersmith did me much evil. At one point, these men were fellowshipping with the Apostle Paul. At one point, they had an opportunity to be a part of his ministry and what God was doing. And the devil got in there. And man, that is more than you can take when somebody that was your friend turns on you and backstabs you and is used of the devil to try to resist you like Judas on Jesus. And you took up your cross to... Follow him. So you've got to expect it. You've got to be ready for it. You've got to know tonight and get it in your head tonight what you're going to do when it happens. Because if you don't, you're going to miss the point and the opportunity at the time to find out some things about God you never knew about him before. He'll sustain you. The ways of the wicked, not just their words, but their ways. They're going about upon the walls, and here's the difference. They're with us in the daytime, right? We're children of the day, not of the night. So they're, they're living two lives. That's how you'll be able to spot the ways of the wicked. They got one foot in church with us, but the other foot's, they're out at nighttime when everybody else is. You know the vast majority of the people that have to be careful about going to Mexico because of kidnappings? are people that go to Mexico because they want to go out at night and party. So they're out in the bars at night. Uh, if we go, we're not going to be out at night. By the time those guys are waking up and getting going, we're going to be hunkered down in there and you know, ready to rock and roll if they want to show up. You know what I mean? Good luck. But why? Because we're not people of the night. I'm not, I'm not out at nighttime. I'm not looking to walk out at night. But these guys are day and night. They're with them. Isn't that interesting? How many people you see in church that got two lives? I'm just telling you right now. Listen, new Christians, that's one thing. Do you understand that? Because if you, if you get to know everybody too much and you get too familiar with what's going on, you're going to think, man, pastor's kind of like two-faced on that. I'm not two-faced at all. You got to take things on a case-by-case -case basis and you got to understand the background and you got to know where they're coming from and sometimes you got to know some details that you don't share with everybody. Or you're not a pastor. You know things that you don't talk to people about. Or you're not a pastor. So you're like, well, why is he letting that go? Well, first of all, maybe he doesn't know. But if he does know, maybe there's more details. Not everybody that's struggling is trying to recruit other people into their sin. You understand the difference? And sometimes when people first start coming, there's a little bit of a, that's inconsistent. Well, I, I want to see some of them just grow. You understand what I mean? I mean, you were, yeah, I, know, I know overnight you walked on water, right? Overnight you didn't struggle with not one more time. I mean, you got rid of everything just like that, had not one more struggle. I mean, you were just 100% clean cut and ready to go the moment you got saved and never had any issues. Tons of sarcasm here, okay? If you're looking at me like he's nuts, he's lost it. Somebody pray for preacher, he's having a nervous breakdown. I'm not, I'm fine. But we forget that, don't we? When we look at other people. 
That being said, that's very different than somebody who's living two lives. And somebody who really thinks they're spiritual and they're into their Bible and they're part of this thing and then they're justifying, well, let me show you some verses on why you can drink. Right. Well, let me show you some verses why, you know, it's technically it's not fornication. Let me show you some verses. Let, let me show you some, you know, come on, man, you're taking it too far. That's old school stuff. That's, that's two lives. That's the ways of the wicked. That's the kind of person that if you don't get them out of that assembly and you don't cut them away from the body... They're the kind of person that's going to undermine that whole thing. It takes God to sustain you, though, when you get around people like this, because I'm telling you, it'll discourage you, just like the sweet psalmist of Israel, man. I mean, he's a man that loves God, and he is seriously troubled about this. Notice also mischief, also in sorrow in verse number 10. Look down at verse number 20. He hath put forth his hands against such as be at peace with him. He hath broken his covenant. You know what? Mischief, it's an interesting word. Somebody who's mischievous, they're a troublemaker. They literally like to cause problems. If there's not a fight, they'll start one. They like to find out what bothers you, and then they do it on purpose just to bother you. Mischievous. Oh, he's so mischievous. Yeah, I, you better be real careful how you're defining that word. And if he's just a mischievous kid, okay, that's great. If you got a mischievous kid, you better watch that. Right. Because there's a fine line between once in a while having a little bit of a prankster or a practical joker that's under control and having a kind of a fun personality, being the class clown and all that stuff. There's a fine line between some of that and being pretty wicked in your heart. Liking to see your mom and dad get mad. Enjoy getting, that, getting that sarcastic smirk on the face when the teacher's all ticked off and you know you pushed her farther than she can take. That's a wicked little heart. You're a wicked little man, you, you little wicked thing, you. Like, you like hurting people. You like saying stuff, the words of the wicked, because of their ways. You like saying stuff and you see that kid crying. You see that kid getting hurt. You're wicked. That kind of person will undermine you, and you got to learn how to recognize that kind of person and get away from them because the devil's going to use them to undermine you and discourage you and drag you down, and it takes God to sustain you when you're around people like that. The ways of the wicked, their ways are selfish, their ways are mischievous, and they'll definitely hurt you. In verse 20, he breaks his covenant. He puts forth his hands against such as be at peace with him. So you want peace, but they're for war. You try to work things out, and they want to always lie and break their deals. You better watch the ways of the wicked. You got to be careful with them. Last of all, you'll see the walk of the wicked. Look at verse number 15. You need God to sustain you because this is the way people are nowadays, and it's going to get worse. He says in verse 15, Let death seize upon them, and let them go down quick into hell. For wickedness is in their dwellings and among them. You know the walk of the wicked in private is a vile thing. He says it in verse 15, wickedness is in their dwellings. There's something about a Christian home. A clean Christian home. Folks, I'm telling you, there's something about it. I mean, I, excuse me for this, but I literally had a dream last night that I walked into my house and it wasn't even the same house I'm in now. It was a completely different house that like you wouldn't think that anything about it would be comforting when I looked at it. I was like, well, I got some work to do. But in the dream, I just had this overwhelming feeling of like, I'm home. <laughs> now, psychologically, that might have had to do with spending all day where we spend all day. You know what I mean? You know that feeling, right? But I just, I can, I can remember even waking up to that, like, that overwhelming feeling of home. Your house ought to be a clean place. I mean, God, God will use your house to sustain you. If your house is a place of quarreling and bickerness, bittering, bickering and bitterness, you need to do some praying. And if you can't get it figured out, you need to get some help. Wickedness is in the ways, the ways of the wicked, the walk of the wicked, the words of the wicked. It's in their dwelling. I don't want to go home and have nothing but constant tension and strife and frustration. And you ever been there? Now, I realize sometimes you can't help it because you're stuck with wicked. Do the best you can and ask God to 
sustain you. Ain't that what we're preaching about tonight? Because if that's what you're stuck with, it's going to take God to sustain you because nobody can live under that forever without God. Wickedness is in their dwellings. Notice something else about them. Look at verse 19. Talking about the walk of the wicked. It says, God shall hear and afflict them, even he that abideth of old. Selah. Watch it. Because they have no changes, therefore they fear not God. You see that? Talking about the walk of the wicked, you know what it is? It's a stubborn walk. Wicked people won't change. Do you understand what I'm saying? That's why you hear preachers with backgrounds in certain industries say some people need to be shot. Because they know by personal experience that certain people won't change. So you let him out of prison, he's going to go hurt somebody else's little girl. Because he's wicked. I don't want to be a wicked man. I remember reading years ago, the Bible says in Proverbs, that violence covereth the mouth of the wicked. And I thought, man, I, I talk too much violence Man, I want to knock that guy out. You know, I'd say that kind of stuff all the time. I grew up with that. My grandpa was that way, and I thought that was just the way guys talked. And I'm like, Lord, I don't want to be a wicked man. I don't, I don't want wickedness anywhere near me. I don't want to be stubborn. A wicked man won't change. Now, I'm not talking about changing for compromise. You know that. I'm talking about changing to say, listen, God, I want to be more like you, and when you show me something about me that's not like you, I want that thing changed. I don't want to stay the way I am. I do not want to be the same man one year from now as I am today. I just don't want to be the same man. I have no desire to be what I am now. I have no desire to be that later. I want God to change me. I want to continually be changing. I've had people come to me, and I'll, well, Pastor, we're leaving you. You've just changed. I'm like, well, praise the Lord. Glad to hear it. It's a blessing. Thank you. Well, I didn't mean it that way. Well, that's how I'm taking it. Somebody like you don't like me anymore, then that's a good sign. Amen. Amen. Why? Because wicked people don't like change. But a righteous man that wants God and is seeking God, a righteous woman says, Lord, change me. Change me, Lord. Please change me. Show me what I need to change. And God, I will fix it. God, please don't let me be. Hey, stubbornness is like iniquity and idolatry. God does not like stubbornness. God does not like a stiff-necked person. God wants somebody that's pliable, somebody that's soft, somebody like the sweet psalmist of Israel who says, God, this thing hurts. These people hurt me. They're everywhere. But God, I don't want to be anything like them. I need you, and I want you, and I'm casting it all on you, and I know you're good for it. I can trust you again. You've never failed me before. You're not going to fail me now. I love you, and I'm sticking with you. Let let them go where they're going to heck with them. I'm sticking with you. Amen. Regardless of what goes on. But he recognizes wicked men, they're not going to change. Notice in verse 20 to 23, But thou, O God, shalt bring them down into the pit of destruction. Bloody and deceitful men shall not live out half their days, but I will trust in thee. What he knew is this. He knew God's judgment was good eventually. And I'm trying to tell you tonight, God's judgment is good. You think you get away with it, and you're not. Be not deceived, God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. You cannot fool God. He knows if you're real and if you're not. He knows if you're here for the right reasons. He knows what reason you're here for. And he knows whether or not you're wicked or righteous. He knows what you are when you go home and shut the door. And nobody else knows. God knows whether you're wicked or not. You know, why do you preach so hard at us? Well, you never know who's hit sitting there. You never know who the devil wants to turn into Judas. And I'd rather let them know what Judas looks like so that they recognize him when he walks up. And say, I ain't going to be that Judas. Lord, I need you to sustain me because the devil's after me. Now, I want you to see in conclusion how God sustains this guy. All right? Watch it. Go back to verse number one. 
A man like David, with all the pressure that's on him, all the wicked that are around him, their words, their ways, and their walk is everywhere, and they're turning on him, and the pressure's on David to try to crack him. So God Almighty has allowed him to be in all this mess. God knew everything about it. And he's sitting there seeing it, saying, God, I, stop these people, get these people, deal with these people, please, Lord. And God's, God's cooking him up because what God's doing is God's saying, I have more for you, David. And uh, if, in order for me to do more with you, then I have to let you deal with this for a while. Do you follow that? Your problems don't always get fixed overnight. You got to understand that. God doesn't always walk up and knock the slats out from underneath them. He sometimes will let them keep kicking you, but he'll sustain you. So how does God sustain this man and what makes him different? Notice, not starting the message over, I'm wrapping it up, give me just a couple of minutes. In verses 1 and 2, a man that gets sustained by God knows how to call on God. He says, give ear to my prayer, O God, and hide not thyself from my supplication. Attend unto me and hear me. I mourn in my complaint and make a noise. What I like about it is there's no super spirituality in it. What, what I'm trying to do right now is I'm trying real quickly to teach you how to pray. There's nothing high rolling about this. There's nothing like, oh man, pastor's listening. I got to make sure I'm saying it all right, right? Is, that's happened like a thousand times. I'm not picking on anybody in particular. Everybody seems to do that, you know, when they're first getting saved or shortly after they've been saved or they get called and, hey, can I call on you to pray? Sure. And it's like the room starts to close in on you. You know what I'm talking about? Because like everybody's listening and is this prayer right or not right? Or it gets kind of awkward and you're trying to scramble in the moment to figure out how to wrap the prayer up. Can I just help you a little bit? Just talk to God. Now, when you're praying a public prayer, there's a couple things about public prayer. If you get called on to pray in public prayer, please don't go on for three, four, five, ten minutes. Make it quick, okay? Number one, don't captivate everybody with your spirituality. Number two, don't share all of your heart when you're praying in public prayer. Lord, I'm really sorry for my sin, and thank you for showing me all the things I've been doing wrong. And God and your wife's over there like, oh, yeah, we're going to marriage counseling after this. I didn't know, right? Yeah. But even in public prayer, don't get so fanciful about your good words and fair speeches that you worry about coming across spiritual because you come across very unspiritual. When you start the these and thous, I know you're full of stuff. You understand what I mean? Yes, sir. I, 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 don't, I don't think it sounds spiritual. I think you sound like an idiot. Just talk to him. He's like, God, give ear to my prayer and hide not yourself from my supplication. Attend unto me and hear me. He's saying, God, please listen. You notice he's got tremendous faith in God, but he's like you and me. He's like, God, I'm, I'm trying to get your attention. I want you to hear. I mourn in my complaint and make a noise. He's like, my heart is crushed in me. I'm just, I'm just, I don't even know how to say it. You know, you don't know how to say it according to Romans. But when you're mourning in your complaint and you're making a noise and you're being honest with God, the Holy Spirit says, I know exactly what to say. I got it. Here, Lord, here's what he needs. And the Lord's answering prayers like you wouldn't believe. I mean, you're probably praying more when you're just hurting and you're just telling him you're hurting than you ever are when you're talking all fancy and spiritual. He's a father. He's not like the wicked casting iniquity on you. Oh, you didn't say it right. Uh-huh. I knew it. Did you hear what he said? I knew it. He knows what you mean. He knows you better than you know yourself. Cast it on the Lord. Call on the Lord. Look down at verses 16 and 17, please. As for me, I will call upon God, and the Lord shall save me. He's learned some things about God over time. And he's saying, let them do what they want. Let them go where they're going. But as for me, I'm learning to call on God. And I know something about God when I call on him. He's good for it. <laughs> you got a good God, man. He says in verse 17, evening and morning and at noon will I pray and cry aloud. And he shall hear my voice. I'm not trying to put an undue burden on you to pray and read your Bible as though you're a preacher or something. Which I do think there's another level that is expected of somebody who's supposed to be preparing messages all, all, over the, all over the place, you know, multiple times a week. But I will say, learn to call on God. Why don't you sometimes on the way home from work just shut off the radio? Or maybe just, hey, Lord, I just want to try this like evening and morning and at noon thing. And just learn to talk to Him. You'll find God will sustain you. God will help you out. God will encourage you. God will get you through if you learn to call on Him. Another thing in the conclusion Number two, he's honest with God. Look at verse four. 
My heart is sore pain within me, and the terrors of death are fallen upon me. Fearfulness and trembling are come upon me, and horror hath overwhelmed me. He's just honest. He's not trying to act like a tough guy with the Lord, not trying to pretend like he's something he's not. He's just being real. Notice something else in verse 15. He leaves his enemies to God. Let death seize upon them. Let them go down quick into hell, for wickedness is in their dwellings and among them. He leaves them to God. You know what you got to do when people are after you, especially if it's somebody in your family? you got to learn how to leave them to God. The more you fight them and the more you push them, the bigger you're going to make your problems. The more you push back at wicked people, the more you become like them. You want to really win? Learn to just leave them to God. All right, honey. Hey, Lord. Deal with knucklehead, will you? It'll sustain you. God has tremendous compassion, especially on somebody trying to do right when you're dealing with wicked people. God will get you through, and if you're not careful, wicked people will break you down. You need God to sustain you. I know, I know what I'm talking about. You need God to sustain you. Look at another thing. He experiences the presence of God. He had delivered my soul in peace from the battle that was against me. He experiences God's presence. The problem's not gone yet, but his soul's in peace because he knows whom he has believed. Here's something else. Look at this. Now, we've been talking about everybody being against him, right? Even backstabbers among the assembly, people that are close to him that hurt you the worst. The worst problems to have are family problems. In verse 18, for there are many with me. Now you see why God says he's a sweet psalmist? This is what happens when somebody hurts you or somebody backstabs you, especially somebody close to you. What you do is you stop trusting everybody. I knew a preacher that was a fill in the blank. So now you're a preacher. That means you're a. No, you're bitter. You ain't the sweet psalmist of Israel. Your problems are making you tough, making you nasty, making you hard, and you're making your problems worse. Because you're not taking those issues to God and saying, Lord, it's tough, but you're God. And you know what he's seeing in the middle of that thing? He's saying, I got hurt real bad, but look at all the guys that stood with me. You see, there are many with me. You know, the only people that I told about my daughter was you all and then immediate family, like mom, mom and her parents. And a couple of people found out, and one of the brothers said, hey, can I tell some people? I said, yeah, we'd appreciate prayers. We didn't know what was happening yet. We didn't, weren't sure what was going on. We just knew her, she couldn't move her foot, her leg, and she had a tremendous headache, and she was just couldn't remember anything at all. Uh, since Sunday, she didn't even remember. I mean, we went down to Lima, Ohio on Monday night, her brother Peacock preached, and the girls rode back separate and with some of the other girls from church, and they had an awesome time and ran over a possum and all kinds of stuff, you know, that she should have remembered Monday night. She couldn't remember anything. I was scared. And it was one of those things where you're calling out to God, but you're not really, like, able to just really, you know, ever get, you ever get there where you like, you're calling out to God, but you're not really able to, like, really able to pray, you know what I mean? Does that sound super unspiritual? But just not really able to just pray. You're just thinking, freaking out. You know, there's adrenaline going on in your body and all kinds of stuff. You're just kind of in a tunnel that we're still sort of trying to pull out of. And I know that sounds super dramatic. I'm certainly not trying to be or feel sorry for ourselves or anything like that. We're very grateful for how good the Lord's been through everything. But I was in that moment. And, and one guy, I said, yeah, tell anybody. I just want people praying. And because, you know, it's very scary. They're doing a scat, CAT scan of the brain. We're praying. We know she's had eye issues since she was six, ten years. We've been dealing with the eye issues, and they say it's a brain problem. And so we're thinking, God, please help that CAT scan not to show a tumor in her brain. I mean, we're wigging out, right? Sure. My phone started lighting up from preachers all over this country. I mean, I'm not joking. All over this country, coast to coast. Hey, we're praying for you. I want you to know we love you. We're praying for you. Can we tell our church to pray? Hey, we love you. We're praying for you. You know what's pretty cool? It's pretty cool to go, you know what? 
there's a whole lot with me. You know what I wasn't doing? Well, that guy doesn't do everything exactly like I do, and that guy doesn't do everything exactly like I do, and that guy doesn't. And I don't, none of that. You know what? Everything comes into super good focus in that moment. And your church family's blowing you up and telling you they love you and they're praying for you. And man, you know what? There are many with me. I'm talking about experiencing God. That's a time when you experience God. And it's the Spirit of God in other people that love you and you realize the reality of that thing. And you know what it does? It sustains you. It's really encouraging. It really makes you appreciate Him and love Him more. David's recognizing, he's seeing clearly, hey, the battle was against me, but there were many with me. And that's true. Don't forget, when you get discouraged, when somebody hurts you, when the devil tries to get you out of church, tries to drive you away from the pack, don't you forget that we're here for you. We're not against you, we're for you. Don't run away from your friends because of your enemies. That's stupid. And look at the last thing and we're done. Verse 22, a full circle. Cast thy burden upon the Lord, and he shall sustain thee. He shall never suffer the righteous to be moved. Reminds me of 1 Peter 5, 7, casting all your care upon him, for he careth for you. You know what you got to do when you got these kind of burdens going on? When you got people hurting you, when you're struggling, you can apply your burden. Obviously, I can apply. I mean, this is the chapter we were in. The outline was done before yesterday, or the rough draft was done before yesterday. Obviously, this applies to my life, right? Not trying to be too obvious, but man, it's a blessing, right? But you can apply it however you want in your life. I don't care what your burden is. In the context, it's wicked people. In the context, it's a brother in the church that hurt him. But it doesn't matter what your burden is. I'm telling you, God's good for it. When you take that thing and you throw it on God and you say, I don't really have any other options. I don't know what to do. God, I like literally am freaked out because I don't know what to do and I hate not knowing what to do. And I, I'm a control freak. And I feel like I can, as long as I keep them close to me, I can keep them safe from anything. And I don't even know what's happening right now. Ain't it good to have a God to throw it on? Let me wrap it up with this quick little testimony. My whole day got messed up yesterday. And I'm not trying to turn this into about me. Please, I hope I'm not coming across that way. I really hope I'm not coming across dramatic. It's just pretty fresh, so here it is, all right? My whole day got changed up. I was supposed to be gone. I wasn't even supposed to be home. I, was, I got down to pray and I did something stupid that I don't normally do because I had a noon appointment and I just, it came into my mind like you don't have time to, because I had to take uh, Sophia to a doctor's appointment for her eyes and Grace had to take two of the other girls to a different doctor's appointment that we never got to obviously. But I'm like, you don't have time. You got to move that appointment from noon to another day because you, you don't, not going to be able to get there and get back. Well, what were you thinking? So I texted the guy I had an appointment with and said, hey, I'm not going to be able to make it at noon. He said, no problem, we'll pick another day. So I was home. Grace was at work, and I was supposed to be gone. Isn't that crazy? No. Lillian hears a bang upstairs, but nothing after that, a funny noise and a bang, and they're like, oh, nothing after that. So we think nothing of it, and nobody goes up there, and I go up to get ready to leave and knock on the door, and hey, Sophia, hey Lillian, it's Sophia, and I find her. What a good God. Ain't that great? And I'm glad I'm the one that found her. Just, I'm just talking about God sustaining you, man. He's just, he knows how to direct your steps and take care of you when you've got no idea he's taking care of you. And there I was repenting because I picked up my phone and sent a text when I'm supposed to be praying. And the Lord's like, hey, stupid, I'm not accepting that repentance because I'm the one that triggered you to send the text. No. Ain't that cool? Yes, what a good God. Cast your burdens on him. He'll carry you through them. All right, let's pray and we'll be dismissed. Sorry I went too long tonight. Father, we love you and we thank you so much.